A modern radar is an ensemble of analog and digital systems all working together in harmony. You have a radar processor, the computer that's the brains of the operation. There's a receiver exciter module, or REX, which translates between the digital world of the processor and the analog world of radio waves. And of course, the antenna, to broadcast radar signals out to the world and hope to receive an echo in return. Those are just some of the main subsystems, and each of those might consist of tens or hundreds of subcomponents with filters and amplifiers and converters. It's a lot of stuff. As a radar engineer designing a new system, hopefully you're testing each of those subsystems individually as you build them up. But at the end of it all, when you finally plug everything together, you need to test that entire system as a whole from end to end to validate that everything works like you designed it to. So how do you validate a radar system? One option is to take it outside, turn it on, and see if it works. For an automotive radar, that means strapping it to your car and driving around town or maybe a test track. If the radar is designed to detect aircraft, take it out to a test range and fly a couple of planes around. See if it identifies them correctly in different situations. This type of open air range testing is often saved for the end of a development program as a final check to say, yes, this system works as we intended it to. The main reason for not jumping straight to range testing is that it's expensive, it's also time consuming, and you may not be able to test everything you want to. Safety concerns might limit what you can do in that car or aircraft, or local broadcast restrictions might limit the radar modes you can use. So before going out to the range, most radar systems are first tested in the controlled environment of a systems integration lab, or SIL, using a piece of test equipment called a radar target generator. The target generator's job is to make the radar think it's out there on the range by simulating that environment and the targets it should detect. You can think of it like a virtual reality game for your radar. We let our radar play a bunch of levels or test scenarios and see how it responds, all from the cozy comfort of our lab. When you play a VR game, it's a closed loop system. It detects your movements, performs some processing based on that, and then displays an image back to you through the goggles. And if it does that fast enough, it seems like you're in the real world. A radar target generator can also be a closed loop system but instead of detecting movements and generating images on tiny screens, it interfaces with the radar in the way the radar sees the world, through radio waves. Now, if you're in a laboratory environment with a bunch of engineers wandering around the place, it's probably not a good idea to turn on a high-powered radar in the middle of that room full of people. So rather than measure radio waves emanating from the antenna over the air, test engineers often use cables to connect their target generator directly to the RF transmit and receive circuitry on the radar to bypass the antenna. If the engineers want to test their radar with the antenna, radiating in a controlled environment, they can use an anechoic chamber, which is a room coated in special materials that absorb radio waves to prevent them from echoing around it. Regardless of how you physically interface with the radar under test, the target generator still does the same basic thing. It measures or captures the transmitted signal from the radar, applies some processing to modify that signal, and then sends the return result back to the radar. So what kind of processing does the target generator apply to that signal to simulate a radar target? Let's consider the scenario of a surveillance radar trying to detect an aircraft. For one, we'll need to delay the signal that gets sent back to the radar to simulate the range or distance it has to travel to the target. We'll also need to attenuate the signal to account for the radar cross-section of our simulated target, which determines how much energy it reflects back. We may also factor in other things that affect the signal as it travels to and from the target, like noise and propagation loss through the atmosphere. If we're simulating a moving target, we'll want to consider its velocity and trajectory to determine the amount of Doppler shift we should apply to the signal. And since most radar systems are designed to track multiple targets, our target generator will probably want to simulate multiple targets to test that capability. We can also simulate sources of clutter, which are other things in the environment that can bounce energy around and back towards the radar, but are not the targets we're trying to detect. Those are things like clouds or nearby terrain features. This scene is already getting pretty busy, so we'll stop there for now. now not every radar target generator will implement all those features. 
In the same way video games have different levels of graphic fidelity, from simple 8-bit graphics to elaborate 3D animations, radar target generators also can have different levels of fidelity based on their purpose. A simple target generator used for production test might only have a basic range delay, attenuation, and Doppler shift, whereas an advanced target generator for validation test might have everything you see here and more. Target generators are usually tailored to meet the specific needs of the radar they're built to test. And since radar systems can vary significantly in terms of their design and purpose, creating target generators to meet all those differing needs is an interesting challenge.